these figures probably will be uh, uh, familiar to you all uh, by now. Obviously, we're seeing increases across all 10 uh, Greater Manchester boroughs. Um, and these are case numbers at a level that we just we just haven't seen anything like this uh, thus far in the pandemic. These are numbers that are way above anything that we've seen before. Um, if we go into the next slide, we will also see that the picture has changed considerably uh, in the over 60s. If you look at the, the month of December, if you look at the start of the month and that left hand side column, uh, to the to the end of the month, uh, there's roughly a tenfold increase, isn't there, going on in in, in most uh, most areas, reflected in the in the Greater Manchester figure uh, as as well. So uh, <clears throat> a big change uh, amongst the uh, uh, older population, and perhaps that uh, also reflects something of the Christmas period uh, effect. Although that will probably continue uh, in the uh, in the coming weeks as well. On to the age breakdown. I think what you can see there, and this slide is becoming, if you like, less helpful because given the case numbers, it's because coming heavily black on that right hand side uh, of the uh, of the table tables. Um, obviously, that um, is, is where we are now, and that's what's coming through the uh, coming through. So we will try and present this in a better way uh, for you next uh, next time. Uh, but it's obviously showing uh, increases across all age ranges, but particularly in the uh, the working uh, the working uh, uh, age groups. If anything, there's been a slight fall off in the in in the um, in in the noughts to fifteens in the schools. If you look at Oldham, for instance, uh, and to a lesser degree in some of the other boroughs, uh, Tameside to a degree. But uh, yeah, the, the 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 schools effect only just beginning to show a little in in the tables, but. With schools back, that will change again, no doubt. If we could go on to care homes. Now, this is a significantly uh, changed picture over the month, um, or over the fortnight, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> and obviously, it's something that is um, is, is uh, very much on our radar at the moment. So that's 4.7% uh, of, of, of residents, but is 50% uh, or more of care homes where uh, you know, we're, we're uh, seeing that uh, there are a significant number of cases, uh, significant, uh, uh, a reasonable number of cases. So the position in care homes is um, is a changed position. And I'll come back to that issue uh, with respect to the main theme that came out of the Greater Manchester uh, Emergency Committee meeting this morning, which was service continuity over January. But I, I will return to that at, at the end, if that's OK. If we might move on to hospitals, um, again, a considerably changed picture over the fortnight uh, with regard to uh, weekly admissions, um, which have uh, more than more than doubled uh, over the uh, over the fortnight. Uh, and uh, in terms of patients uh, diagnosed uh, within the hospital setting, uh, so more than doubled over over the week. So a very considerable uh, change uh, there. If we look in terms of what that means for general and acute beds, uh, the very bottom line of the table, sorry, if we go back, um, again, uh, a very uh, significant increase in the number of patients in, in those beds. But that figure with regard to high dependency and intensive care is, is interesting in that context in that we really haven't seen uh, that's come through yet. Now, the caveat we always have to place on that is, of course, it, it takes time for people who are in hospital uh, potentially to move from a general or an acute bed uh, to a higher dependency bed or intensive care bed. Uh, but um, it, it's it's remarkably stable, uh, that, that figure as we stand. Uh, and of course, again, something that we continue to keep a, a close watch on, both in terms of the national data on that and the international data. If we can move on to vaccination, uh, please. Uh, so there you can see uh, the latest picture for uh, Greater Manchester uh, in terms of um, first, second and booster uh, doses. Um, uh, again, re reflects an amazing effort of so many, uh, so many people. Um, the uh, booster uh, programme has been hit by people not showing for their appointments. Uh, 
uh, but we think that's a reflection of the, the higher number of cases that we've experienced in, in recent weeks, which has disrupted uh, the booster rollout programme uh, to, some, to some degree. Uh, and they, they were the reports that were coming through from some of our districts uh, today. So that um, uh, concludes the, um, uh, the, the slides. And if I might just sort of um, come back to that issue that I touched on, which is uh, the continuity of service provision uh, across the different public services in Greater Manchester. And that is very much uh, the, the thing that is at the foremost uh, of minds uh, as we come into to January. Um, uh, it was described to us that January is going to be uh, a very difficult month uh, for uh, public services in Greater Manchester, given the, the position with, um, with staff uh, sickness uh, and absence uh, due to, to isolation. And I thought it might be helpful uh, for colleagues to have the latest uh, figures uh, with regard to um, uh, staffing absence on the front line in, in our various public services. So we are currently uh, seeing around 15%, 1-5% staff absence uh, in the NHS. Greater Manchester Police had experienced a higher rate of staff absence over the uh, holiday period, getting up towards 11%, but is currently 9.5%, so a slight uh, improvement uh, in the position. Um, close to 14%, 1 4 for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, that 13.8 to be uh, to be uh, to, to be exact. Uh, and with regard to the transport system and particularly Metrolink drivers, uh, we are cur currently looking at 13% absence, 1 3, and that led to uh, service disruption uh, over the new year the new year period. So. These are levels of staff, staff absence that are having differential impacts on, on services. Um, the GMP position is that it's difficult but manageable at the moment, but obviously beginning to have more impact uh, in, um, in the NHS, beginning to having more impact in the NHS. And actually the sector that is most impacted at the moment is, is social, uh, social care. We are currently working on improving uh, surveillance of these issues across all public services in Greater Manchester, but the early reports are that the most significant difference, uh, difficulty we have at the moment is, is that um, uh, service continuity in, in social care. To illustrate that point, uh, the latest figures given to the committee today on uh, discharge of patients uh, from hospital, we uh, believe there are around 650 people in hospital beds in Greater Manchester who are medically fit to be discharged but um, around half of our care homes are currently unable to accept new residents. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, the, the position in the NHS is going to be affected by supporting services. And that's why we're taking this broad view of um, the continuity of provision throughout a month where it, we, we expect it to be, to be very difficult. The position in schools will only become clear uh, in the next week or so. Uh, but it's unlikely to be to be any different uh, from from those other public services. So to summarise all of that um, with regard to where uh, the, the, uh, the if you like the mood was is very much a, you know a sobering presentation, um, a, a very challenging month ahead of us. Nobody's in any doubt uh, about that. Recognising that we're talking about staff who haven't had much of a Christmas or New Year break, uh, and there was lots of levels of fatigue. Uh, in the system, not just at the front line, but in uh, in officers who are managers who are supporting uh, supporting the front line. So a challenging uh, position. Uh, I think we were all of the view that we would not use the phrase "ride it out" because um, that that isn't necessarily going to be possible. Um, and we think um, we need to be more uh, more cognizant of of how how challenging this might uh, might be. We welcome uh, the reports that there is about to be a change on testing uh, and particularly the uh, suggestion that uh, people who have no symptoms, asymptomatic people being able to use a, uh, a positive lateral flow as the, you know, the first day uh, of isolation. Uh, we believe that could bring uh, some flexibility uh, to, the, um, to, to the front line with regard to people being able to return. 
um, and also free up PCR lab capacity uh, for, for staff who may need to continue to get a, a PCR test, particularly NHS and social care staff. So we, we welcome a, a change in that direction. Uh, we um, kind of heard from uh, different public services this morning who were saying that they just hoped uh, that, that the, um, the asymptomatic uh, lateral flow test uh, would be available to, to let's say, um, staff who were in not not in care settings, so that we could have that maximum uh, maximum flexibility. We um, obviously recognise what the government said yesterday about sticking to to Plan B. Um, if there was to be uh, a message, we believe that could be strengthened nationally. Uh, our view would be that it should be the work from home uh, message. Uh, which I think could be could be strengthened, and particularly colleagues pointed uh, this morning to the fact that uh, the government hasn't uh, legislated to allow council uh, business to be conducted online. Uh, so as it stands, uh, council meetings and committees, and at the Greater Manchester level too, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and its committees will have to meet in person. Uh, we don't believe that's right or, or setting the right example. Uh, and we believe to, to strengthen the work at home message, the government uh, should move on that, uh, sensibly move uh, council, local government business uh, back to a position where it's conducted online, particularly as we get through what is a, a challenging uh, month for people working in councils. Uh, so the council staff who have to support those meetings um, and in all other public services in, in Greater Manchester. So uh, a, a difficult picture overall, but that said, um, obviously a, a different one to the to the, the picture we've uh, faced before. Uh, people absolutely are doing everything to rise uh, rise to the to the challenge. Um, we we are confident that we can obviously uh, can get can get through. Uh, there has been the change uh, you will have seen in the news today around um, uh, elective uh, procedures in Greater Manchester. Um, with regard to our, our hospitals, that is a temporary move that will be kept under regular review. Um, and uh, the message to patients is that um, they should wait to be contacted and not necessarily call the GP themselves or the, uh, or the hospital themselves. Um, wait to be contacted. And if people aren't contacted, they should absolutely uh, turn up for their for their appointment. So we hope it's a, a temporary uh, move. Certainly we're working to that end uh, as we 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 hope uh, the pressure will begin to subside as as the month progresses, but that will be kept under regular review. So I think for now I'm going to leave it there. And as ever, want to uh, to to get into your questions uh, today. So thanks for listening uh, to that, Ross. I'm handing it back to you. Thanks, Andy. Um, if colleagues in the media could indicate if they want to ask a question by using the raised hand function, and I'll just give colleagues a, a few minutes um, to do that. Um, it should be at the top of your screen, I'm seeing some colleagues already, which is great. Um, I'm going to go to Jack um, uh, Delhanty. Jack, if you could just, uh, you should be able to open your microphone and your camera now. Um, oh, you've disappeared for me. Jack, can you open your microphone? Yep. Hello. Fabulous. We can, can hear you if you want to ask you a question. Yes, we can. I should have said oh, Happy New Year to you, Jack, and I should have said Happy New Year to all colleagues on the call. But uh, yeah, over to you. All right, cool. Um, I was going to ask, just because it's only been about a month or so since Omicron really started to gain pace, did you expect when it originally started to spread? I'm afraid, Jack, I lost the middle part of oh. your question there. I don't know if you could try again. Hang on. Um, I was just asking, it's only been about a Jack, I think what we'll do is if you put your hand back up, so I think you, you lowered it, and we'll, we'll come back to you. We're struggling a little bit with your signal, um, so we'll come back to you if you put oh, your okay. hand back up um, and maybe just see if you can try and get a slightly better connection, um, and we'll come back to you. Right, um, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to go to um, Helena. You should be able to open your mic and camera now and ask your question. Hi, uh, it's Helena Vesti from the Manchester Evening News. Um, what does the latest modelling show for Greater Manchester, particularly in terms of bed capacity, staffing levels and admissions over the coming weeks? 
And secondly, what are you going to do if we start running out of beds um, as these high levels of admissions continue? Is it field hospitals? Is it Nightingale sites? Will the military be brought in to support NHS staff? Thanks, uh, thanks, Helena. So uh, one figure I could give you would be for bed occupancy, which um, has remained um, constant at uh, around 90%, in fact, just a little bit under. Um, and I think um, that reflects the work that's gone on to discharge the patients who could be uh, discharged. Um, and and obviously the, the way in which um, uh, the hospital setting has been has been managed, but it is it is and obviously anticipating what was coming with regard to the winter. So the NHS has done a, a really amazing job so far at kind of managing, uh, if you if you like, bed occupancy at, at as as safe a level as can be as can be managed, and that hasn't changed uh, over over the period with regard to staffing. I mentioned the figure of, of 15. It has we, the NHS was talking of 10 to 15 percent staff absence in recent weeks, but that is now 15. So it has risen to the, you know, to, to, to the higher level, and um, uh, it's why we're looking very closely at this move on testing, because uh, while it's likely that NHS staff, even if asymptomatic, will still have to get a PCR, the freeing up of the lab capacity should mean that there's not a delay for those PCR tests, so that obviously that will improve uh, the, the speed with which NHS staff can be brought back uh, brought back to the um, to the front line. I mean obviously there are mutual aid uh, provisions in in place in the NHS um, and they are not they are not uh, needed at this particular uh, moment in, in time. Um, it's it's a case of what you know we, we are watching this though very uh, very carefully uh, indeed. As we go through the rest, the rest of this month, there will be uh, the ability to stand up extra beds, as we did in the earlier waves um, uh, uh, last year and the year before. Uh, it wouldn't be the Nightingale situation, but you know there are uh, the, the, there is the ability to uh, mobilise extra bed capacity should that be needed. I am aware, given the figures I gave to you around critical care and high dependency beds that some staff that have been used to support those beds have been moved into, if you like, into the general and acute uh, uh, setting. So, you know, all of these resources are being flexibly deployed. And at the at this point in time, as it is very difficult, but the NHS is, is managing, but the expectation is that the month will get more difficult before it gets, before it gets better. Thank you. Thanks, Helena. Um, Jack, who asked the first question, if you could raise your hand again and we'll come back to you because I think you're back in the, the meeting. I'm going to go to Adam Clark uh, in the meantime. Uh, Adam, you should be able to turn on your camera and microphone uh, and ask a question. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Uh, Adam Clark from Roach Valley Radio. Andy, a question away from COVID. Obviously, we've seen the uh, Anne Williams documentary on ITV uh, this week and we, we saw a tweet from yourself and the your Liverpool counterpart uh, Steve Rotherham uh, last night uh, around the, the Hillsborough law that you, you attempted to, to bring through Parliament when you were an MP and I know there's uh, an online rally planned for, for later this week I don't know whether you could tell us uh, a bit more about that. Yeah absolutely Adam thanks uh, very much for asking about that I mean I don't know if everybody's watching the um, the Anne drama uh, on ITV. I think it will be followed by a documentary on Thursday. I think it's um, television at its most powerful, to be honest. I'd like to congratulate Maxine Peake uh, for the way that she is faithfully capturing the essence of Anne. I, I knew Anne not well, but I did know her. Uh, and I think everyone is completely you know, uh, struck by how, how well she's capturing uh, uh, what what Anne was about, but also obviously Anne's struggle represents all of the families as well, and you know it, it very much speaks to, to that all of their experience. I think Kevin Sampson, the uh, screenwriter, has done a, a phenomenal job in telling the, the the human story, if you like, behind the, the 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 wider story that people may may know. I think the drama really captures that. Um, but the truth of the matter is, as 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 we will kind of um, be bringing over later this week, that this is Anne's 
story is not, if you like, stuck in the past, in that there are bereaved families going through something very similar today because the legal system hasn't changed. It's still cruel when it comes to the way it deals with bereaved families. They go into courtrooms raw with grief and still uh, face, you know, the highest uh, Q, the highest QCs in the land hired at great public expense where they're scrabbling around for for, for legal uh, legal fees. Um, it's, it's a system where the odds are completely stacked against uh, bereaved families and where truth is often not established at the first uh, opportunity. And you can think of inquest relating to major disasters, but also just affecting individual families. The system doesn't work for them. And the Hillsborough law, to get onto that point, Adam, is actually a call, it's, a, it's shorthand for a comprehensive and fundamental reform of the legal and criminal justice system, to, if, to use the phrase, to level up the scales of justice in favour of, of bereaved families. The odds are massively stacked against them at the moment. I saw that at first hand as I went on that, that journey uh, through, uh, through fighting for, for justice with the Hillsborough uh, families. There is huge um, uh, challenge that, that they face. As I say, the system is cruel in the way it treats people. Um, and at the moment, we have a situation where um, public, public services uh, can, uh, can in many ways, uh, close ranks and, and we don't often get, get to the truth. And it's why at the heart of the um, Hillsborough law is a proposed uh, statutory duty of candour on police and other public services uh, alongside a, a call for parity of funding uh, for bereaved families at, at inquests. Um, there's a call for a public advocate to support families bereaved during major incidents. Um, a whole set of other measures which we will, you know, we will um, lay out on on Friday. The time has come for a fundamental reset of the system. And I would just say to anybody who's been touched by, by Anne's story, uh, who has been moved by what you've seen, just be uh, aware that this is still going on today and will continue to go on until the, this system is fundamentally reset in favour of bereaved families. And that's the call that we'll be making jointly with other uh, families in similar positions and senior public figures uh, on Friday. And we'll obviously make sure that all colleagues in the media are, are given details of that, of that event. It will be a major, major intervention, um, cross-party, uh, people from all walks of life coming together to make that clear call, Hillsborough Law now. Uh, Bishop James Jones was brought in a couple of years ago to review the experience of the Hillsborough families and he issued a report uh, in 2017 calling for a number of changes, some of which I've just, just um, uh, set out to you. That still has not received a response from the government. Uh, and one of the calls on Friday will be, there has to be a response to that uh, report uh, and legislation brought forward to correct things. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, I'm gonna to go to uh, Noah Hoffman. Um, you should be able to turn your microphone camera on now if you just say who you are, where you're from and ask a question, please. Hi, Andy. Oh, can you hear me? I can, Noah. Yeah. Nice Hi, Noah you. from Politics Home. Um, also a question moving away from COVID a bit. Uh, could you please confirm whether you intend to follow in Sadiq Khan's footsteps and launch a trial scheme to decriminalise cannabis or any other drugs for that matter in Greater Manchester? And do you support Khan's efforts to reform police responses to young people found in possession of drugs? Or are you of your party leader's view that decriminalisation is not a way forward? So I'll be honest, uh, no, I'm not across all of the details of, uh, of the London proposal. As, as much as I am, uh, I understand it to be a uh, you know, a small uh, scale pilot um, linked to, I think it's 18 to 24 year old in, a, in, a, in a, a number of areas. But although I'm not, you know, as I say, I wouldn't want to claim that I know all of the details of it. I also believe it's yet to be approved. Um, uh, so, you know, we're, 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 we're not fully, if you like, uh, aware of all of the details of it. 
what I can say is we have no plans at the moment to do uh, to do anything similar. Uh, however, if the London trial does go ahead, we will of course look at it um, with regard to the um, to the learning that that comes that comes from it. But I would just stress you know, at this point in time, we have no no plans for anything similar. Thanks. I'm going to go to Charlotte Cox. Um, Charlotte, you should be able to um, open your mic and. Um... Yeah, thanks. Yep. Ross. Hi, Andy. Hi, Charlotte. Um, you've spoken today about care home outbreaks, staff absence and problems accepting patients from hospital. Do you think there need to be more measures in care homes to lower the infection rate? Um, we've also been speaking to care home staff today who report huge delays in PCR testing and also financial issues caused by two years of COVID and the government funding having run out. Will care homes be getting any more support over the coming months for that? Well, thanks, Charlotte. I, as I said, certainly the picture that we um, uh, were given this morning was of concern uh, in care homes. Um, you've seen the figures with regard to uh, levels of infection. Um, now, obviously, they are different from the wider population, and I wouldn't want to in any way uh, worry uh, worry the public at the moment, although it, you know, it has changed. Um, it, it's obviously proportionate given how many care home residents uh, had infection going back a couple of weeks ago, and it's nowhere near the level uh, in the wider wider population, but it is something that we are we are looking at. But on the staff um, absence point of view, I think that was one area where there is a, um, uh, a higher level of concern in a number of our boroughs uh, around around service continuity, and I did give you the figure of a half of care homes being unable to accept new new uh, new residents. Now, as I understand it, the government's the logic of the government's change to the testing uh, regime and then the isolation regime, i.e., people who are asymptomatic can just take a lateral flow test and then begin their isolation from an, a positive uh, lateral flow. The aim of that is to free up the PCR uh, lab capacity, uh, particularly in relation to tests for social care staff and NHS staff. So that could help, but we would say do that as quickly as possible, uh, because obviously that that is that is needed. With regard to the financial situation, we had a report this morning that you know adult social care um, uh, does have funding to support care homes uh, through this, but we're not seeing the. The level of funding that we had when we there was the infection control uh, grant that was in place for for care homes. So I, I think the summary of all of that, Charlotte, is that you know care homes are are in a, a precarious position, not so much from the infection point of view at this moment in time, but certainly from uh, the um, staff absence point of view, and therefore the service continuity point of view, and that then is knocking back on the NHS with that figure of. 659 people in hospital but unable to be uh, to be discharged so you know all of this is clearly of concern the committee agreed today that it would be meeting weekly uh, through january we haven't been meeting weekly at the back end of 2021 but we will be going going forward uh, and it's very much um you know because of the position that we were presented uh, uh with this morning with regard to the situation in all public services but but social care uh, very much among them. Thanks very much. I'm going to go to Hannah Miller. Uh, we've got a lot of questions um, to get through today. Uh, Hannah, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hi, Hannah. Hannah, are you able to turn on your mic? Hi, hi. can you hear me? Right. I yes. can now, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay great. Um, uh, two questions really. One, you just said it might not be possible to ride it out. Are you saying that there might not be enough beds to go around? And secondly, was all of this avoidable? So firstly, on the um, uh, ride it out uh, comment, I I'm just saying that that isn't a phrase that we would we would use from our perspective here in Greater Manchester. Um, because I don't think it does justice to uh, the position in our public services and the pressure that um, staff working in the NHS in social care and on, on the front line in other services. Um, I don't think it reflects the position that they're that they're 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 in. Um, you know, they are it, things are difficult uh, right now, 
and um, and could get more more difficult as we go through this month. As we all know, schools have uh, returned this week. Um, students probably returning in most places today um, after the setup day yesterday. Uh, what effect is that going to have? You know, on a, on a much increased case rate. So, I think what we're saying is, you know, I think there's perhaps some implied complacency in the ride it out uh, phrase, or it sounds a little blasé, and that, that's not how you know the mood is in Greater Manchester at the moment. It's vigilant, it's concerned. Um, there's not a, as I said before Christmas, a wish to rush to uh, restrictions. That's not where where people are. But it's about taking you know, sensible steps, for instance, the moving of local government meetings online immediately. I mean, that just seems a, a straightforward, simple thing uh, that um, that should uh, that should should be done. Um, so, yeah, I guess yeah, what we're reflecting is that, you know, a, a slightly different mood to the one that's prevailing at a national a national level. Hannah, the second part of your question was. Just that a lot of people will be very angry when they hear that they're non urgent operation has been cancelled was that avoidable it's obviously a, it, it's it's difficult um uh to say isn't it because this is unprecedented uh and i am you know to be fair to the government uh, recognizing that they've you know been right in my view not to overreact because we know that if um, you know there is an overreaction, that can cause problems in a different way to people's mental health or you know, pressure in other parts of the system. It's a it's a complicated uh, state of affairs. We know that January often will bring uh, challenges to hospital with regard to the elective waiting list. So, you know, I, I think people need to um, bear that in mind. It's a temporary move. Uh, it's important to stress that it will be reviewed regularly. And the minute it can be lifted, it, it will be. But given the staff absence that I mentioned of 15%, it's it's um, it, it's it's unavoidable uh, from our point of view. Could it have been avoided with a, a different approach at a national a national level? I think it's 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 obviously difficult to say that because of you know this being a you know an unprecedented an unprecedented situation. I don't think anybody here anyway anticipated the case numbers. At the level that we can see today in the in in, in the figures, um, so I think it's important to be pragmatic about this. Um, but I, I I would I would say you know if we want to to re remove that restriction at the uh, first opportunity, it does mean becoming kind of stronger in our messaging around stay at home, taking sensible steps where where we can, um, and minimising the disruption to to hospital patients and hospitals more broadly. Thanks. I'm going to go to uh, Josh Halliday. Uh, Josh, you should be able to open up your microphone now and ask your question. Hi, Andy. Happy New Year, everyone. Hope, Hi, Josh. Sorry about me. the background uh, interruptions here. I had a little dog as well. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'll pick up on uh, Hannah's question, if that's OK. I just wondered if you could flesh out a little bit more what, what it means by it might not be possible for the NHS to, to ride this out. Um, beyond perhaps you know pausing of uh, non-urgent surgery and appointments what does, what does it mean for patients does it mean that um the nhs locally it is overwhelmed currently or will very soon possibly be overwhelmed um, and secondly uh, on the same sort of vein uh, have any of greater manchester's trusts or hospitals declared ma major incidents and does it sound like that's likely thank you Thank you, thank you, uh, Josh. Um, so, firstly, just to uh, kind of uh, say a little more in terms of what I said to Hannah. I mean, I absolutely recognise that you know patients affected will feel um, in a very um, kind of frustrated place, worried perhaps uh, today about what this means, um, and it's it's not a step that anybody would want want to take. But but it is winter, and often the NHS does have to take. Uh, steps to protect um, emergency services and and obviously uh, non-elective work at this particular uh, time time of year. I think what, rather than saying that the NHS won't be able to ride it out, I just was saying just that we wouldn't use that phrase because it, it it implies that it's 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 all okay, doesn't it? Or it's not so bad, and it'll all you know, we're just you know, batting down the hatches. We'll we'll be fine. I think we believe we need to um, uh, be 
more uh, more vigilant than, than that um, and, and you know recognize that uh, this month will present real challenges that was the message we were getting from our from our experts uh, this morning it's going to be a very difficult month um, not just in the NHS but in all public services where service continuity is going to be a real challenge not saying we won't get through it um, but I think that's the approach that we're taking as opposed to oh well you know we'll just have to just just you know write it all out and it'll all be okay come February well I, you know we're just not in you know we're reflecting a slightly different different position. Josh, the second part of your question was what? Oh, my apologies, the background, the disruption. Yeah, no worries. There is a <laughs> throw. No me worries. Off. It might have been a better question than mine, but I asked about um, whether any of the Greater Manchester hospitals or NHS trusts oh, have apologies. declared major incidents. No, they haven't. But obviously, they have taken this escalation measure jointly. So obviously, it affects seventeen uh, hospitals. Um, and that's you know that's been been done together um, uh, that escalation um, to to that level. Uh, so you know that's not an individual hospital declaring a major incident, but it is the system moving as one, uh, supporting each other uh, to that um, to that to that higher level uh, of, um, of of vigilance with regard to the situation that we're in. And as I said, it's going to be reviewed regularly. Um, so it will be reviewed, you know, as, as we go through this, as we go through this month um, and the minute it can be removed, it, it will be. So we are seeking to minimise disruption to patients. But, but when you look at the numbers coming in um, and how that's changed in terms of hospital admissions, it almost is a very big change. And consequently, hospitals need to, uh, to, to, to create the capacity to deal with that, that change and what may come in the rest of the month. Uh, yeah, so. So oh, yeah, hello, Jack Dalhanty from the Mill. I was just going to ask a question surrounding bed occupancy. Um, you said earlier that occupancy at the minute is kind of hovering around 90%. How much has that risen in the past few weeks? And also, it's not necessarily unusual for, for us to have bed occupancy at that level, in some of our trusts anyway. So how does that pressure compare to previous years? Thank you, uh, Jack. So I'm just as I'm speaking to you, calling up the um, uh, the, the presentation that was um, it was put to the uh, committee uh, today, and I just want to be absolutely sure that um, I'm giving you a very precise answer uh, here. So currently, uh, bed occupancy is 89.8%, uh, and that is of the as of the 7th of of January, um, and that has um, pretty much been the level, uh, despite uh, short uh, fall over the Christmas period since the um, uh, since late August. So it's been managed at that at that level uh, all the way through. Now, obviously, with the move that's been announced today, that that is in if you know because obviously you wouldn't want to go higher than that. You know, if you go above. 90% you are moving beyond what is considered to be a safe occupancy uh, level in the NHS. So why it's stable, it is still high and it doesn't leave much room uh, for manoeuvre. So the move that's been announced, you know, reflecting the increased admissions to hospital that I've kind of presented to you, um, this, um, uh, this move with regard to um, non-urgent uh, appointments obviously creates that extra uh, capacity to be able to maintain bed occupancy at the level that it's been at uh, for the second half of of 2021 and, and coming into into this this year. So it is not necessarily um, unprecedented at this at this time uh, of year, but I think you know we are still in the sort of earlier stages of the numbers coming into hospital, and we expect this to continue for uh, certainly the uh, the next few weeks. So it's a it's a position that is going to to change. It's why I keep saying we're going to keep the um, the moves that have been made under regular uh, regular review. Um, but it's a sensible precaution at this stage, recognising that it will it will inconvenience and and worry uh, a number of patients in, in Greater Manchester. But it's not been done not been done lightly. We are confident that the um, the system will will manage uh, what's coming towards it. I think the the, the very positive thing at this moment in time is that it's not leading to people 
requiring that much uh, more intensive level of support in the hospital. Uh, and that, that takes a, a pressure off. If you go back to um, times in 2021 or 2020, it was the worry of critical care capacity being overwhelmed that was very much at the, uh, you know, the, the front of people's, people's minds. But, you know, I, I mean, I certainly would come back to a point that Charlotte Cox raised before. You know, if we've got 659 people in beds who could be discharged were it not for issues in social care, I mean, that is an area where the government urgently needs to turn its attention and to put in place the extra support or the flexibility in terms of staffing in, in the social care sector to be able to uh, add, add, take further pressure off, 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 um, off acute beds. So it's a, it's a complicated picture. Jack is, is the honest answer. It is uh, challenging but manageable at this particular moment, moment in time. Um, but you know, we, we, we have to keep watching this um, day to day to make sure that um, you know, we, can, we can get through this, uh, uh, this dangerous period. Uh, this is from Dominic Hughes at the BBC, Andy. How would you describe the situation in hospitals at the moment and what is driving that staff sickness uh, and admissions or both? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Dominic. Sorry about the, the, the problems. I mean, obviously, the um, the case rate, the high case rate, is is driving uh, the admissions. I mean, this was always what experts uh, said to us actually at the start of this wave that uh, there was a reasonable degree of confidence that uh, Omicron would not present the same severity with regard to. Um, the level of care patients needed, but it would be the numbers of people coming to hospital at the same time would be would be the issue, and it it looks like uh, from the the figures that we've we've presented today that that is uh, that is the, um, uh, the 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 challenge. Um, so it's that it's the high case rate that's um, that that's driving it. How would I describe the position? Well, you know, it, 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 it's. It's obviously highly challenging, given everything else that the um, NHS uh, is facing, as we all know, through through this particular period of the year. This is always uh, the most challenging uh, moment of the year uh, for the NHS. The first two or three weeks of the new of the new year. Uh, so this this wave, the timing of this wave is uh, is probably the worst possible uh, worst possible uh, timing. Um, the staff absence could be being driven by uh, some of the issues with regard to testing that we've seen over the holiday period, uh, problems in the availability of PCR uh, testing. We haven't much mentioned lateral flow today. I think it's fair to say there was patchy availability of lateral flow tests, probably better availability for NHS staff than others, but still um, not, not the, um, uh, you know, the full provision that we would have, we would have wanted. The government's move on testing, it would seem, is we're anticipating a government move, and it may well indeed be be, be being announced uh, today uh, to to free up that PCR lab capacity to support a quicker return of NHS staff uh, to to work. Uh, so we would certainly um, uh, support that. It sounds like a sounds like a, a sensible sensible move, uh, but obviously it can't be the NHS alone. I think the government does quite urgently need to turn its attention uh, to social care. And um, that that is an issue of staffing availability, but also potentially finance, as uh, as Charlotte Cox was was asking before. So it's it's a complex, uh, complex picture uh, that we that we have uh, right now, um, leading to the move that the, um, the Greater Manchester hospitals have made uh, made today. Um, that is about a sensible precaution. Uh, at the start of what is going to be uh, a very difficult month. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think Andrew Noel um, uh, has emailed his question as well over to Jimmy, so I'm going to pass over to Jimmy. Thanks, Ross. Andrew, thank you for your email. Um, Andy, how concerned are you about schools going back and what this could do to case rates over the next couple of weeks? Uh, are measures to slow COVID in classrooms enough? Well, certainly that's a new layer of complexity, Andrew. Um, and I think that's why the mood of our committee was as it was today, well, for a range of reasons, but that being one of them, because that's another unknown now, isn't it? On, In the midst of what is already a challenging 
picture, we're going to see that new pressure uh, introduced, which is obviously the return of schools. Now, nobody wants uh, to see uh, kids um, uh, at home again. You know, we all want to, to see kids in school, but it, it is felt within our uh, within our uh, committee that, that you know this is going to be um, going to be challenging. One very specific call that's been made is on Ofsted to relieve schools uh, of of inspections during this uh, period. You know they are facing an incredibly complex uh, challenge bringing kids back into school, uh, and that is something that um, that was some that was raised uh, raised today uh, to to create that extra. Um, uh, breathing space, if you like, to manage to manage all of this. There is a, a concern about the availability of lateral flow tests to, to support schools in what they are uh, what they are doing and managing the isolation uh, and and other arrangements. Uh, so uh, yes, there is a a, a, a concern. Uh, there was broad agreement that the the mask requirement was the right the right move, um, uh, but um, we we will have a report on schools uh, next week uh, and we agreed to meet next week because we recognise that the return of schools uh, could add uh, an extra pressure into what is already a, a challenging picture. Thanks, Annie. I'm going to try Freddie Gower's microphone uh, one final time. If not, um, Freddie, if you want to email us, we'll, we'll come back to you. Freddie, are you able to unmute yourself? I don't think so. So I think given the time, we'll have to, to finish. Um, uh, now, and if you get oh. any final thoughts before we finish, Jay Ross. Um, no, I think we've covered obviously um, a, a lot of ground uh, today, and uh, you know I hope colleagues are just picking up um, the kind of general kind of feeling of where we are. Just to, in conclusion, you know what I would want people to take away is that we're not overreacting. This isn't uh, doom and gloom. Um, you know, there's a lot of fatigue, as I said, in the system, but. People are doing you know, a brilliant job, and we've got plans in hand to to get get through this. And we've we're working closer as a Greater Manchester system than probably we've ever worked before. That's both within the NHS, but also between the NHS and local government. So there's real positives here. Um, there's a huge amount of joint working uh, going on. Um, there's big focus on the booster as people become eligible for that again in January, and obviously making sure that people take that up. So, you know, it, it's not about overreacting or should I say underreacting and hence the comments that I've I've made today you know we need to uh, have our we need to have our eyes wide open to what could lie ahead in the rest of January and we need to see the real risks uh, to the continuity of provision in some of our critical public uh, public services so we need to um, take steps uh, to support those services as we go through as we go through this uh, month, uh, and I, I would say uh, perhaps consider strengthening national uh, national national messaging, particularly around uh, working working from home. As I was doing that, somewhat uh, Ross, I noticed Lucy. I think put her hand up. I don't know whether uh, Lucy, you want to ask your question. I don't know whether you can. In fact, oh. can you unmute? Uh, is that working? It is, it is. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, we've uh, written quite a lot about the clean air zone and there has been more and more social media activity around it in the last couple of days. And I just wondered yep. if there's any movement on that, if there's going to be any changes in reaction to that or anything that you wanted to say. No, sure. That's uh, you know, another another thing that uh, obviously we've been, um, been discussing, actually not just uh, in recent days, last last year, so um, it, 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 it was clear to us that there was um, a change in the vehicle market in the second half of 2021 from some of the work that uh, the leaders and myself had, had commissioned. So we, we were actually looking at that late last year and we, we're still looking at it. Um, and uh, without going into all the details today, um, with myself and um, Councillor Andrew Weston who leads on the Greater Manchester Clean Air Zone will make a statement in the next 24 hours about it in terms of where we are up to. Because what we don't want to do is leave a vacuum and you know people sort of speculating about what's happening. We want to be really clear with people about what we're um what what we're where we're up to and what we're doing. Uh, so I you know can't say more than that right right now, but we are 
you know, looking very, uh, you know, very closely at all of these, all of these issues. And, you know, I, I should say I recognise that, you know, this is a tough time for people who may be, who may be affected uh, by, by this. I, I know people do like to say this is all a greater Manchester creation. Well, I just do need to remind uh, people that it was the government at national level having lost a court case that Im imposed a legal direction on all 10 councils of Greater Manchester, requiring all of them to introduce a category C clean air zone. So, you know, it, it, it isn't the case that we're in a position where, you know, we, could, we, 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 we can just ignore that, you know, that, that is the reality of the position that we're in. Um, it, it is a, a government directive. Uh, but obviously we have a huge regard for our residents and the need to support our residents um, through uh, through the change and, and through what is a challenging time, recognising that people's capacity changes to change is reduced by the pandemic. So we're looking at all of that, Lucy, um, uh, right now. We'll, we'll say more uh, in the next 24 hours and probably more uh, in the next couple of weeks, actually, as we as we try and make sense of everything that's being presented uh, to us. Uh, and yeah, I just want to assure residents that we we hear what people are saying. We understand the concerns that uh, uh, that people have. It's our job to turn those into a, you know, a practical way forward, and we're working on that. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Andy. I think that's us. Good. As I said, happy New Year, year everybody. It uh, feels like it's already going to be another another challenging one. But um, thanks for attending today and for your uh, for your, your excellent questions. And we'll we'll probably see you next week because we are going to have a Greater Manchester Emergency Committee next week, and um, we will um, we will uh, reconvene this briefing this time next week. So thanks for coming. See you then. Cheers, everyone.